Hello and welcome to this short tour of the STM32 F0 Discovery Board. Now the Discovery Board range is ST's low cost introduction to the STM32 range of ARM MCUs. And this one, the F0 Discovery Board, gives you an introduction to the ARM Cortex M0, the lowest power, lowest cost device in ST's range so far. Firstly, let's take a look at how ST have um, designed the interface between the PC and the um, Cortex M0 that we can see down there. So down, down this end, we have the USB Mini B connector, which is used connect, to connect directly to your PC. Um, the little chip that you can see there is an STM32F103C86. It contains the, an implementation of ST-Link, basically so you, you don't need any extra external hardware to connect this device to your, to your PC. You can just plug it in and program it straight away. All of the circuitry around this part of the board here is to do with either S, the ST-Link device or the power supply. Now if, you want, if for some reason you didn't want to use the onboard ST-Link, you can just detach those two jumpers that you can see there labelled ST-Link and it disables the onboard ST-Link and then you can use this header here, the SWD header, to program the device. Now let's just have a quick word about the power supply. The, the power supply is, is, is all sourced from the 5 volt line on the USB plug. Now, you can see there D1 is connected in line with this power supply. It's a Schottky diode that um, is there just to make sure that current only flows in one direction. But it does have the side effect of dropping the voltage. So where, where you see 5 volts labelled on the pin header there at the end, it's not actually 5 volts. In the worst case, it could be uh, the 5 volts line of USB running at its lowest permissible level, which is actually 4.75. Um, and then you've got to subtract the forward voltage of the um, of the diode there, which is 0.23. So you could be looking at a low as, uh, as low as around four and a half volts on what's actually labelled 5V there. So just bear that in mind if you if you're powering external devices from here. Now another word on the power supply: the, the MCU itself is powered from that um, little little chip that you can see there labelled U1. Looks like a SOT23 device. Um, I looked that I looked that up, and and the specifications um, are such that you can draw you can draw a maximum of 150 milliamps from it, and it's specified to output 3.3 volts. However, ST have connected another shock key in line of the, with the output of that device, and the um, and the MCU itself, and also the 3V outputs of this board. So where these where these um, outputs are labeled 3V, they are actually 3V. They're not the 3.3 output of that um, of that regulator because of the inline diode D2 there. Quickly before moving on, let's just have a quick look at the LEDs. You can see one labelled PWR there on the right. That's obviously a power LED. It comes it just comes on when when the um, device is connected to a PC. The the multicolour LED there LD2. Um, I'm afraid you can't get to it from the MCU. It's it's simply a status indicator for the ST Link. It changes colour depending on whether the ST-Link is connected or not and whether it's actually hooked up to an active debugger at the other end. It kind of goes orange and green, you can flashes, you, you make all kind of silly lights, you, you, you'll see it when you use it. Okay, you've probably already noticed that there's quite a few options and, and, and parts here that are not fitted to the board. Footprint's basically left blank for you to choose um, how you want this board to behave. So let's just take a look at some of those as we go as we go across. Now JP1 there is um, it, it allows you to either get access to um, the TX and RX pins of the um, one of the built-in USARTs. I think it's USART one. You can see on the schematic. By default, it's actually connected to um, TX and RX pins of the of the um, SWD um, serial wire debugging ports. But again, if you connect up a couple of the solder bridges, um, you can see in the schematic they become TX and RX for the for one of the USARTs, which can be quite useful. Now, let's let's move on to the crystals and oscillators. Now, the big can eight megahertz oscillator there is devoted to the um, the, the, the ST Link on board of on board the um, F one hundred three. There, it serves no other purpose. The empty footprint there X two. We'll deal with X two first. Is where you can mount um, an oscillator um, to to feed the clock for the the Cortex M zero itself. Um, by default, the Cortex actually sources its clock from an internal oscillator, known as the um, the HSI, the High Speed Internal. If you fit that and fit a co some corresponding capacitors and some solder bridges, which you can see in the schematic, 
then the um, MCU can be clocked um, from an external crystal. Reasons why you might want to do that, well the, the HSI according to um, ST isn't particularly accurate, it's got about 1% accuracy. Um, if you were to fit an external crystal then you can, you can generally get a lot of more accurate clock than that. Um, X3 there is a, is a footprint for what well, looks like an SMD oscillator. Um, I don't think ST give a sample part number for that, for that, but um, it's, I think it appears to be a standard size. Anyway, it's for the 32 kilohertz oscillator that you might use for the um, internal RTC, the real-time clock. And there's the MCU itself. It's an STM32 F051R8T6 in an LQFP64 package. As mentioned earlier, by default it's, it's um, clocked internally by an internal HSI, as ST call it, the High Speed Internal Oscillator, which clocks its, um, at 8 MHz, and a system of multipliers and dividers um, through a PLL ultimately give you a core clock speed of 48 MHz. If best to refer to the uh, RM0091 document to see how the clock tree inside the STM32 actually feeds out from, from these internal multipliers, dividers, etc. As far as external peripherals go on this board, you don't get many. You get a button, which is nice. There it is, the user button. And you've even got a, um, a solder bridge somewhere that you can put in that will disable that if you don't want it to be operational. The other button is simply reset. Everybody needs a reset. Um, if you mess your programs up as often as I do, then you know that reset is one of the most important buttons on the board. There are a couple of LEDs as well that are hooked up to um, some of the GPIO pins. Um, they're obviously useful for debugging, some you know, stuff like that, indicators. But um, anyway, you know all you know all about how to drive those already, I guess. So that's pretty much all you get on this side, except of course the headers at the side. Now, this is a bugbear of mine with the ST's boards. These these headers, and we'll have a look at how they look on both sides of the board. If you can see them here, they go all the way through, and they're short on the top and long on the bottom. Now I suppose the idea might have been that you plant this into a breadboard and then you can you can feed wires out from the left and right, but it does mean that you need to have a breadboard handy and you, you just you don't necessarily want to bung this thing into a breadboard. It's quite big, take up quite a large amount of your board. And if you want to plug wires in, into the top, you, you can, but they're loose. They don't make very good connections. So sometimes if you think you've got a dicky connection, I actually pull the thing off the top and fit it onto the longer connection on the bottom where the wires tend to fit better. Let me give you an example of this. I mean, this is this is the kind of wire I use all the time to make in interconnects between between boards. It's just you know the kind of cheap thing you can get in packs of 20 or 50 on eBay for just for a few pounds. So the idea is that you just plug these wires in just like like so across a pin and well you can see there that it just doesn't fit too well it's really quite keen to waggle around and come off every other board that you can that you see apart from these um, these discovery boards have the long pins facing up so you can plant the wires on and they make a good connection and you know not likely to to fly off or anything when you move things around your workspace anyway I just thought I'd mention that and while I've got the board turned over let's have a look at the back end see if there's anything useful on on, on this back side here um, really, there isn't. You'll you'll never really want to be looking at this side of the board when you're in use. There's nothing. There's nothing particularly interesting here. Just some solder bridges that you can look up. That you can look at the function of those um, inside the, um, the the schematic. Basically, they just select the things I was talking about earlier: oscillators, clocks, and whether things like the button are actually doing anything. Lastly, another thing that's worth worth mentioning on this board, and you don't see this often. It's a nice little touch from ST. If you look at um, JP2 there, you can see it's near the MCU. Normally it's on and you'd hardly ever want to take it off, but what it actually does, it's in line with the power supply. So if you if you take that off, you can connect an ammeter between the two pins of, the, of that jumper and you can measure the um, power consumption of the, um, of the MCU itself. That's quite a nice touch. It just allows you to um, prototype your design and when you're done you can you can measure the power consumption and that would give you perhaps a good idea of, of the kind of voltage regulator that you might want to design into your part. Okay, well there's not, as you can see, there are not many peripherals on this board. 
It is the cheapest board in the Discovery range, but it is extremely useful. I've had this a very long time and I use it all the time whenever I want to test something out on the F-Zero. Um, they're so cheap, you might as well get one or two or whatever. P pretty much the only, th the only um, downside to these, these type of boards, for, for the beginners who like to mount uh, development boards inside the chassis of their finished project, you might find it a little difficult to do that with the Discovery boards because there are no mounting holes. Really the only way you can do it is to somehow utilize the uh, the pins perhaps some of the pins that you're not using on the bottom to grip into um, part of the uh, you know your, your project's chassis but it would be a bit of a hack uh, anyway that's really the only downside to what is a cheap and cheerful board that does well pretty much what it says on the tin anyway i hope you enjoyed that and i'll be back later with more reviews and more more fun videos thank you for watching